Hey guys, welcome back to the Leverage Advantage show. Today, we are extremely humbled, we're very honored, we're very grateful to have Jill Schiffelbein with us. Now, enthusiastic, driven, passionate, creative, sharp and dynamic. These are all words audiences use to describe Jill. And she was a university faculty turned entrepreneur. Uh, in fact, she's an award-winning business owner, author, and a recovering academic. She taught business communication at Arizona State University for 11 years and was a pioneer in the online education space, creating an office serving 60,000 students, adding $1 million in revenue its first year with no staff or operational budget. Now, though, Jill focuses on providing custom communication training and strategies for her clients through workshops, keynote speaking, consulting, and virtual training. She's helped clients all over the spectrum learn dynamic communication skills from boomers to millennials to Generation Z from Fortune 500 companies, nonprofit organizations, and even some reluctant professional athletes. Her latest book, Dynamic Communication, 27 Strategies to Grow, Lead, and Manage Your Business, is in bookstores across the United States. Welcome, Jill. Thank you so much for having me. And it's funny when you sit and you're listening to your bio, no matter how you write it, it's like, oh, listening to all this stuff about me feels like a bulleted list. So I'm excited to get into some of the non-bullet points with you today. <laughs> no, I, I, I was very excited to have you on the show because, you know, I, I, I want to tell you a real, real quick story. When I was young, so maybe when I was 10, right? Um, one of the skills that I chose to excel in was communication. Because I believed that with communication, uh, you could pretty much get whatever you want, right? You could influence people um, and, and it, it forms that basis of uh, that foundation for interaction and for relationships. So uh, that was the one thing that I wanted to excel in. So I was really excited to have you um, on, on the show. But uh, tell us a little bit about what you call dynamic communication. What, what does that mean? So what I found through teaching at the university and then when I first started into, you know, the corporate consulting, corporate training and everything else, what I found is people were so focused on the words and so focused on the message, you know, dotting the I's, crossing the T's. And when it comes down to it, you can have the most grammatically correct, eloquently crafted message in the entire world. But if it doesn't result in action, then what's the point? Absolutely. So dynamic communication is focused on that action. It's results driven, it's action oriented, and it may not be the prettiest language at all times, but it's language and communication that gets results. I love it because when, and, and this is the, the disconnect that I feel we have in our education system. Like you said, you're, you're a recovering ac academic, right? And in academic writing, in academic language, you write in a very specific way. Um, and when you want to communicate with people, this is one of the things I learned from, from my um, teacher in middle school, right, is this. Speak to be understood, not to be heard. It doesn't matter if what you say doesn't land on the person that you're, that, that you're speaking to. Like, like for example, um, in school, we're taught to speak in a, in a very specific way, right? And it, it is very academic because it, it's academia. But when you're speaking to somebody in the market, right, when you're speaking to somebody on the streets and you speak like that, yeah, there's just this huge disconnect. You, don't, you, you lose rapport, the, the, the message doesn't get through and people look at you weird. It's so true. And what's, what's sad about it to me and why I think I have such a passion for what I do is when you look at the academic space, when you're looking at communication theory and organizational management theory and everything, there are some really important tenets of that that are really executable in the non-academic space, right? Like outside of the journal article or outside of the study. But what happens is nobody is making that transition from the ivory tower in the academic sense to actually real life. And so what I try to do is when there is a theory that's relevant, 
to mention it, to cite it, but not in the boring academic way, right? Um, and that's one of the things that I love about what I do. It's because, yeah, listen, here's what we're going to do, but here's actually why it's going to work and why it's going to work is based in research and is based in science. But you often don't have people who are bridging that gap, and that's what I enjoy doing. Awesome. So, uh, I, you know, th th this conversation with you um, reminds me a little bit about Actually, one of my favorite YouTube videos, I, I'm very sure you have seen it. Um, it's Simon Sinek's How Great Leaders Inspire Action, right? And it, it's one of my favorite videos because it teaches you a communication structure that, that gets people to take action, right? And, like, and the way that he presents it, the way that he wraps it around science, right, um, gives, gives you this, oh, that, then you understand it so much better. How does that compare with, with the strategies that you teach in, in your book and in your keynotes? It, it's similar, and anytime I can be compared to Simon Sinek, even tangentially in a conversation, I feel like I'm having a pretty good day, so thank you for that. <laughs> but uh, you know what? When I first started looking into maybe doing the entrepreneur thing, one of the books that actually inspired me the most was Robert Cialdini's book, Influence, The Power of Persuasion, right? And through a, a whole circumstance of situations, his company actually became one of my first clients when I broke off into, uh, you know, doing my own thing, which is wow. incredible, right? Wow. Um, but I remember reading that book. I was a junior in college, and I remember reading that book thinking, he just made the scientific easily understandable, and it made sense. And it was presented in a way that wasn't, you know, intentionally academic or let me use all these big words to sound really smart. It was real life stories. It was real life examples. And when I went to graduate school, I decided then and there that everything I was learning, I would decide a way to make it tangible for people I knew. So making the theoretical tangible is something that I've always focused on. And in terms of presenting it in lines of research, it's yeah, like, hey, hey guys, here's a step-by-step -step things to do it, or here's this theory that exists, and you may have heard of it in school, like Monroe's Motivated Sequence or Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs, right? Things that people commonly hear about, they can regurgitate, but they really have no idea how to apply in a way that will make them better connections, better business, better bottom line. And that's what I enjoy doing, is showing them that, yeah, these tenets, they're actually good. You learn these for a reason, but here's the extra step in applying them, which is going to make all the difference. That's amazing. Like I always have the book handy with me. <laughs> it's, it's actually one of my favorite books. It's amazing. In fact, uh, one of our partners, we just sent him to Traffic and Conversion Summit in yeah. um, San Diego and, and Cialdini was a, was a keynote speaker there. Mm -hmm. um, here's, here's the thing that I think a lot of people don't realize about language is this, that, that there, the value of language actually, it, it differs in different settings, right? So for example, in, if you're in academia, there's a very specific way you need to write. But I think a lot of people don't, under, don't truly understand how language influences behavior, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, like, of course, we see, we see a lot of this, of, of course, in, in neuro-linguistic programming as well. You know, like, for example, you know, instead of using, instead of using but, use and, right? To, to expand your possibilities. Instead of saying, I have to say, I get to, and that rewires your, your, your brain a little bit. Um, and so one of the biggest things I learned about communication was, what, was the business value of language. If you could write in a way, well, there are two, two things. If you could write in a way that, that influences people to buy, that has a tremendous amount of value to, mm -hmm. to businesses, which is, which is what copywriting is. And that in itself is such a is such a niche skill. It's something that needs to be honed so tightly. And then the other the other thing about communication in, in business is really about communication and leadership. How do you communicate in a way that you're able to to build an organization that helps you achieve the organizational goals and of course their own personal goals as well? How how would you? What are some of the basic principles you feel that businesses need to keep in mind where in terms of communicating within their organization? You know what I find really interesting with a lot of the groups that I work in, um, I have, so everything I do is customized, but of course, like every, you know, expert out there, we have the skeletons of all our programs. You know, the skeleton is not going to change, but the muscles flex in different ways, depending on who the client is, what the situation is, et cetera. And 
what um, one of the things I do is around navigating difficult conversations. So whether that's in leadership, whether that's in feedback and performance reviews, whether it's in conflict, it's, you know, how to navigate with specific strategies. What I find though, is that a lot of businesses when they have brought in training in the past, it's cookie cutter training. It's here's this principle, here's this outline, now go apply it for this one situation without taking into account the whole entire picture that surrounds it. Well, there's not just like one little piece that you can turn right in, you know, here's one screw and the whole system's going to be fixed. No, that's really not it. So one of the examples that I think a lot of people can reference is the idea of the feedback sandwich where if you're going to give some negative feedback, you want to say something nice, but then say the bad thing and then end with something nice, right? Like the mean, you know, the not so good thing is the meat in the middle. And then you have the two pieces of bread on top and bottom. And yep. in the big picture, that is accurate. Meaning you want to try to be more positive than you are negative. But if you go into every single situation like that, it actually minimizes the corrective impact that that feedback situation has. And so what happens is people who, you know, are presenting this more cookie cutter training or who don't have the theoretical expertise to examine the entire system, not just this one problem, it's really, it's, it's really an issue because they go in and they're like, here's this framework you can use. And then you have managers, you know, walking in there you know what, Jill, I'm really happy with how you're doing this, but here's something that needs to be, again, using but instead of and, call back to your NLP comment, right? No, but here is something that needs to be replaced, but I'm really liking how you're doing this at the end. What am I going to remember, right? I'm going to remember a mixed message because it's like happy, happy, and then one critical thing. Well, I'm doing two things right, so how bad can it really be? And it just gives the wrong mention of feedback and it doesn't drive action in the same way that specific behavioral sentences start with certain words actually produce. And so that's the thing you, when you just apply one model in an isolated situation, it doesn't work because humans don't exist in a vacuum. I love, I love, I love what you just talked about because I know that the, that the feedback sandwich is, is such a controversial um, topic like so many people teach it and but I disagree with it right no mm -hmm. I agree I agree that we need to communicate uh, when our when, when the organization does well right and like we need to point at every opportunity we get but when somebody does something that is unacceptable it, we shouldn't sugarcoat it with with here's what you did right you know mm -hmm. and so I, 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 I love what you said but how can we then communicate like feedback like that differently? Well, it's really focused on having it one frequently, right? So when you are giving the feedback, making it specific and behavioral, if you're starting out the feedback conversation with the word you, so you need to ask different questions on the interview. That puts you immediately on the defensive. Your mind, the way it listens, is going to be listening in a completely different way just by starting with the simple word you. And it's really understanding the psychological effect that that has on people and then what follows is completely different. So things like that, things like if you're going to give feedback, positive or negative, it has to be both specific and behavior focused. You need to give it different timestamps, situations, data points, and then you need to focus on the behavior of a person, not the characteristic. Characteristics are things that could take decades to change if they ever change at all. But specific behaviors in situations can be altered. And oftentimes I find people attacking the person, not intending to be mean, but attack, attacking the character instead of the behavior. Whereas, for example, I tend to be, um, you know, you may not know it in my day job, but when I'm done, when I'm done with work, I am an incredibly introverted person. I like to sit on my couch. I don't like to talk to anybody. I sit, I just insulate. And if you would see me out in business and say, wow, she's the most outgoing person, and label me as that as a characteristic, it's not respecting this other side of me. Whereas you could say, hey, I know you're probably exhausted, but if you can change this behavior in this one situation, that's going to help instead of, hey, we need you to be more energetic. You know, it's very specific because be more energetic can be interpreted a million different ways. And in the same vein, 
if you're giving positive messages to someone, you're saying, oh, Bob, you're doing great. Oh, Jill, you're doing fantastic. Oh, Robert, I'm really loving what you're doing. Oh, this is great. You're a good worker. Keep up the good work. That actually does nothing. And studies show that can actually hurt more than help because when people don't have any specific feedback, positive or negative, they don't know what exactly they're doing well yep. and what to keep doing. And it becomes a guessing game. Absolutely. And, and here's, here's what I've, here's what I got from what you just said. Right. So, um, like you said, make it specific and timestamp it. Right. And also, um, critique the behavior, not the character. Don't, don't make it personal. So just based on that, it's, it's very similar to how I communicate things, uh, uh, feedback. Right. So here, one of the things I would say is, um, is it okay if I is it okay if I share something with you? Is it okay? Or basically asking permission, right? Uh, is what I do, right? So is it okay if I I share something with you, or or would you be open to coaching right now? Is what I would say. So then I'll tell them. So the first thing I would do is I I'll say my experience of of you. So this may not necessarily be with everybody, but this is my experience of you. Is that when you did this at this particular time? the outcome of it was, this is, this is what happened. So I told them exactly what they do, did. I, I shared with them exactly what the outcome was. And then I tell look, it's, it's not, a, it's not um, I'm not making a personal attack. So I wouldn't say that. So what I'm saying is that this particular action has a negative mm -hmm. result. So what we need to do is we need to be more conscious of, of, of to avoid situations like this so that we don't continue having this negative result. That, so that, that's how I would apply basically what, what you said. How, how is that sound? And depending on the situation, some of it may need to be altered a little bit. But in general, you have the exact right idea. It's very specific. It's behavioral. It's cause and effect. It's owning your message at the beginning. This was my interpretation. This is what I saw. You're owning that part of it and not generalizing it to a whole group. Yeah. The one thing is if you are doing a peer-to-peer -peer conversation, how you started out asking them if they were open to the conversation in the first place is important, right? That shows some respect. Now, if you're in the managerial role it's a little different right they Absolutely. that's your job as a manager to kind of go in there but that's just when you say I've noticed this this mm -hmm. happened facts and this was a result and then you continue on with the conversation but oftentimes I do find what a lot of managers will do is they can get that first part right I noticed this here's what happened and here is the effect but instead of then letting the employee have room to have a discussion about it and come up with ideas on their own, the manager will proactively say, so I need you to do this. Now, in some situations, that's warranted. But if you're actually open to that dialogue between you and the employee, you'll be surprised at the results that you can get. Awesome. I'm really, really interested to, to know and to learn a little bit about your journey as one of the pioneers of online education. Can you tell, tell me a little bit about that business? Yeah, so very long story short, I was in undergrad and I took my first online class and this was like early, early stage online class in 2003 and it was text-based, right? It was pretty much like a correspondence course, but I was introduced because the teacher at the time was kind of a techie and I was introduced to a simple bot, like an automation bot. Now, this was back in 2003 three, so 15 years ago. So just imagine how rudimentary that technology was. But I became fascinated by it. And so I took it upon myself to take every free workshop in technology that the university offered. And when I was in grad school, I did the same thing. I decided to actually help build for a professor while I was an undergrad an online uh, supplement site for his course when I was a senior and then just started playing with it and expanding it. So there were people doing it before me in a basic form, but at least at Arizona State University where I was, it wasn't centralized, it wasn't an office, it wasn't something that actually had standards behind it. And so in 2006, I actually started in the communication department, developing fully online courses, slowly introducing the concept of video, not just recorded lectures, but then shorter videos. And it's funny to me that 10 years later, people are still talking about these micro videos. I'm like, man, you're a decade behind. I got that down. But it was really transformative for me to see, especially how the students reacted to it, right? And I will never forget, if I may share kind of a funny story with you in the audience here, is in 2007, 
I was teaching a crisis communication class and I had to go to a conference for work and I'm a bit of a control freak. See, I will own that. And I didn't want to have a substitute come in to teach my students, especially because I actually created this course from scratch. And I told my students, I said, listen, I'm not going to be able to come, but here's what I'm going to do for you. We're going to have an online lesson. You're going to have an online quiz and a discussion board. So you don't have to come to class. You need to do this. Again, keep in mind, this is 11 years ago. So I got on my little webcam, like a little Logitech HD webcam, put it on the computer. And the lesson at the time was um, about mission statements and how it's really important in a crisis communication situation to have a strong mission statement at the company so you could reference back and it help will help to guide your communication when you're navigating the crisis. So I'm giving this seven minute video about that. And it was one of the first videos I ever made. And I was so determined knowing how public speaking is, right? That you need to make eye contact. I'm like, I'm going to make eye contact with this. So I'm going to do it now. And it's going to be really awkward for everyone who's watching this, which is great. So I was like up in front of the camera. I was so intent. I would hold up without even looking at like hold up visuals to try to give words. And I was just focused and focused and focused. And then I posted it. The next class period, I asked my students, hey, how did you like it? They're like, oh my gosh, more teachers need to do this. This is amazing. If online classes were like this, this would be great, yada, yada, yada. And then one guy in the back of the room raised his hand and he said, Jill, because I'm informal, I don't need to be called professor, faculty, whatever, I don't need a title. He goes, can, can I point something out? I said, you know the rules, Robert, as long as you do it respectfully, absolutely. He goes, I loved it, please do it again but it was a little creepy because I don't think you blinked once. <laughs> and then some other students were like, no, I don't think you did either. So we actually pulled the video up in class that day and watched it. And at about three minutes in, I finally blinked and everyone applauded and it was the most hysterical. <laughs> oh, gosh. But that, that's part of my growing pain. So, you know, you have to learn those things in some capacity at some time. And so that was, you know, well over a decade ago now, but it, it was a fun path. And what I love about what I do now is communicating in a face-to-face -face environment is one thing and digital communication is another. Yes, you have some principles that are the same, but some of the rules change and the way people understand information changes. And so to be able to navigate both of those environments gives me a unique lens when I go into clients. That's awesome. And I have a burning question. My question is this. Mm -hmm. So I, I've always been an entrepreneur. I'm, I'm a little bit, one of the reasons why I decided to go into entrepreneurship is because I felt the conventional path was, was too restrictive. And I'm a little bit, I've, I've got a little bit of a problem with authority, right? So that's why I decided I had to be an entrepreneur because even if I, got a, a, if I got a job, I'd be fired in 24 hours. Right? So I was unemployable in that way. Um, so my question for you is, how do you, how do you, having, Having straddled both paths, being an academic and then now being an entrepreneur, uh, share with me the disparity between the two. What, what, are, what is that contrast for you? You know what's really interesting? One of the biggest contrasts is a lot of it depends on the manager. I know a lot of entrepreneurs like us who say like we're unemployable with the right manager and the right structure, you're actually not. The smart companies are hiring people with our mindsets more and more and more. Yep. But the problem is most companies don't know how to manage them because they have someone in a more traditional management role trying to manage people who aren't used to being managed. So it just doesn't work out at all. So for me, the big thing was my first manager gave me a lot of leeway in the academic space. And I just have a master's degree. I don't have a PhD. But after the first year, when management shifted over and I had a new dean that I was reporting under, basically told me that. I was 27, 28 at the time, basically said, um, you've pretty much hit your ceiling. After I brought them in a million additional dollars in revenue, right? Like I am a revenue generating unit. I had no budget. I had no staff. It was reallocating, systematizing things in process and helping drive marketing from a student perspective, using students on campus that didn't cost anything to help bump up online enrollments. That and there was a pent up need, right? So I can't take complete brain credit for it. There was a pent up need that I was able to address. But after that, I was basically told, yeah, there's one more level we could promote you to. Like, I'm in my 20s and you just pretty much told me that unless I jump through hoops to get a piece of paper, which isn't a, ch like, it's not a challenge and it's not diminishing anyone who goes down that path, but it's literally, you just have to focus for three to four years on it. It's not, you know, but that's not what I wanted to do. And as soon as that was laid out for me, I said, 
no matter how much good I do, I'm never going to have the respect of my actions. And that drew a clear line for me. So I looked at, at the time, what was my vestment date? So five years in full time, I was going to be matched for my vestment in my 401k. So I said, I'm going to suck it up until then. So I have a little nest egg going into my own thing. And that's when I cut the full-time cord. So it was really, if you have the right manager in place, who's willing and open to listen, to communicate and say, okay, listen, Jill, I know this is how you would like to do it. Here's a system that exists. Let's find a way to work in the middle then we can navigate those environments. Um, but for me, that type of structure was really valuable. Oh man, we're having such an awesome conversation. I just want to just want to touch on that a little bit is this. I completely agree with you that, you see, especially in a lot of Asian cultures, a lot of organizations are built on seniority. And I think, and, and this is the thing, being great at what you do as a job doesn't make you a great manager. So you can be there for 10 years and not learn any management skills and get promoted in manager. And we've actually seen a lot of organizations um, promote by seniority and, and have a detrimental effect. You promote the wrong person, the re a lot of the, the large chunk of the organization leaves. So for me, I don't look at managers as much as, as I you see, as much as I have a, a problem with authority, that doesn't mean I'm, I, I don't have find mentors. So I have a lot of people that I respect because of what they've done, because of the things they can teach me. And I think these are certain things that, that a lot of organizations can learn from. Right? So if somebody is a manager, it's not because they've been there for 10 years. It's because they are able to collectively raise the performance of everybody else in that micro organization. And so, and the other thing I wanted to say based on your story is that's precisely the reason why um, I decided to create my organization. And right now, I'm, I'm, a lot of people in, within my, my, my environment, they're having problems and struggles within the organization they're in. There's a lot of friction, right? And they, they can't do this because, because of politics and so on and so forth. And, and to me, I'm like, oh, these rules infuriate me so much that I choose to play a different game, right? Every, and it's a very different game. So I, that's, that's why I love so much what, what you said. Um, right. So here's, here's what I'd love to ask you though. Um, as we come to the end of the podcast is this, what's the best advice you've ever received? Oh gosh, there's, there's so many good nuggets. So let me just give you like a lot of little tweetable lines here that you can do. Uh, like when you're at 80% press play or go or push the button, whatever it is, right? Because spending time on that 20% when you can course correct, you know, why waste the time? It's never going to be perfect. Another one that I love and that I really try to think of is don't talk about it, be about it. And as entrepreneurs, we often like to share ideas and brainstorm and everything, but we can get caught in that rut where we're sharing and ideating a lot instead of taking action. Um, and maybe it's because of lack of bandwidth or it's because of fear or any number of things, but don't talk about it, be about it. It's, uh, I have to repeat it to myself almost every day at some point. Awesome. And if people would like to know more about what you do, where, where can they go? You can go, you can find me everywhere on social at Dynamic Jill. My last name is a beast to spell, so I make it easy at Dynamic Jill. The dynamiccommunicator.com is the official business website. Um, and of course, there's more. I have the prop, right? If you are interested, this is the latest book that's out. You can find it on Amazon at Barnes and Noble and bookstores all around uh, the USA, but then online around the world. And what was fun for me about this to translate into my past and my present is I had a textbook when I was in the university setting. I had a business communication textbook. It was used in universities all over the world and it was great, but it was theory, 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 and then maybe a case study thrown in per chapter. This is a, you pick it up, there's 27 different strategies. You just need one in your business. You read it five minutes, you've gotten your value from the book. If there's a relevant theory, I bring it in and tell you about it, but in a very colloquial conversational way. So it's kind of my, this is the book that really shows my love for all things communication in different areas, but making the theoretical tangible. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jill Schiffelbein. Thank you so much for spending the time with us. Uh, again, very honored, very humble, very grateful to have you on. Thank you.
Me, I'm so grateful. Thank you so much. Hey there, thanks so much for checking out this video. If you enjoyed it, check out the relevant video here. And don't forget to subscribe to us for more marketing tips, techniques, strategies that are working for us, or just more behind the scenes fun. See ya.